So I'm going to start by uh, my intro and then I'm going to give the facilitation to the leadership to Laura. So hi, everyone, and welcome back uh, to our very church day. Uh, thank you for joining us for our third panel to discuss generative AI to promote quality, equity, and mental health in higher education. I'm thrilled to welcome extraordinary and forward-thinking panelist, Jordan Sruer. Uh, she's assistant provost for Education Resources and Innovation at the Lebanese American University. Alec Kouros, he's Professor of Education Technology and Media and, and, uh, and Media and Director of the Center for Teaching and Learning at the University of Regina. Uh, Brian Alexander, he's a Senior Scholar at Georgetown University, internationally known futurist, researcher, writer, speaker, consultant, working in the field of higher education uh, future. Trish Ull, uh, she's Head of Learning Enablement and Innovation at Edward Johns, uh, Prompt Engineer and Learning Executive Leading and Building Generative AI Apps with Team of Learning Engineers and Human Capital, and Valerie uh, Irvin, she's Professor of Education Technology at the University of Victoria and President of OTESA, the Open Technology and Education Society and Scholarship Association. Association. And of course, the amazing and my co-researcher, Laura Weiner, she is uh, the Director of Teaching and Learning Services um, and Associate Professor in the Department of Education and Counseling Psychology at McGill University, who will be facilitating the discussion. A small reminder, we have the chat feature that is enabled, but please use the Q&A uh, for your questions and specify the name of the panelists to whom you are addressing your questions so they can actually see your questions and respond to, the, to them more uh, easily. Our uh, webinar is um, is live on Facebook and the link is shared on, on LinkedIn and on Twitter. So, Laura, I give you the floor. Thank you very much, Nadia. And I'm going to get right to questioning because we have some very, uh, we have a short amount of time, some very interesting speakers and some very important questions. So I'm going to start by challenging each of you to share with us in three minutes. Yes, Brian, you're right, get ready. Um, your journey and experiences with generative AI and, and or I guess your thoughts on the potentials, challenges and drivers of using generative AI in higher education. Um, we'll start with Jordan. Excellent. Thank you so much. And thank you all for amazing organization. The super on time starts are super impressive, given that we're coming from all over the world to do this. So well done. Um, so my personal journey uh, includes uh, my research side, uh, which is really focused on the design and application of machine learning models to, to novel settings. So I, I look at um, building machine learning tools, uh, for fields even as archaeology um, or construction engineering. I really love the idea that the same fundamental machine learning models can apply across so many different fields and we can do that creatively. So that's my sort of personal forays into um, AI is really from the perspective of machine learning. But of course, I, you know, like anyone else, have been experimenting with ChatGPT and DALI and Elicit and Tome AI and all kinds of other AI tools that are out there to facilitate work in a higher education. So that's my personal journey. Um, being the Assistant Provost for Educational uh, Resources and Innovation, I am also the head of our Center for Innovative Learning. And so my university journey with AI <laughs> includes mediating a lot of different opinions uh, from those screaming, we should ban it all, to those saying, we should use it for everything um, and everything in between. So that's my, my university journey re uh, relative to AI. I think in terms of the drivers, challenges, uh, challenges and potentials of AI, well, I think the dr drivers are kind of just obvious in facilitating what we as modern human beings uh, think of as work. And so in higher education for faculty, that means, you know, writing and grading exams. And for students, that means writing papers. Um, so I think that's the main driver. It makes our life easier, uh, perhaps. Uh, and the main challenges, of course, are policy to regulate use. And also, I think to me, this is more important and more germane to this uh, session, is ensuring equitable access. Uh, it is the, the wave of the future, and we know already that the digital divide is, is great. So I think really thinking through equitable access. And then, of course, the potentials. Um, and 
you know, I think that the potential comes in facilitating the learning process uh, for a variety of different learning types. And I think we'll get more into that across the panel. So I'd like to hear from my colleagues. Thank you very much, Jordan. Uh, next, I'll turn to Alec. Well, thank you. Um, it's great to be here. And thanks for all of the organization, as Jordan says. And I probably could just ditto everything that Jordan uh, said in her last piece here. Uh, very similar to my experience. My personal uh, experience in this is just my my in it, my curiosity around ed tech. I've been passionate around ed tech my entire career, and uh, this obviously is 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 something big. I, I was looking at uh, my uh, er earlier videos from back from uh, early '92 and '93, talking about um, the internet as being this big thing, and I feel like this is this all over again. Um, and what a ride that was. <laughs> so if it's anything like that, then I think we'll, um, you know, we'll, we'll continue on well. Um, uh, also, I'm the director of the CTL, uh, Center for Te Teaching and Learning. And obviously, uh, I'm, I'm getting a lot of what Jordan's getting, um, you know, opposite sides. Um, a lot of people who are really fearful, uh, I've heard, thank God I'm retiring uh, a lot <laughs> in the last little while. And some people very, very excited about uh, what's ahead. And so in almost every survey I've done in, in a presentation, if you look at the distribution, it's people right across, like in terms of their skills, uh, in terms of their um, uh, the, in terms of their understanding and knowledge, their skills, um, but, uh, but as well um, as in terms of their outlook for what's ahead. Uh, people are really scared that this is, you know, sort of the end of the world, um, you know, taking that approach and, and literal, literally the end of the world um, versus this is just a new horizon for education. And, and I, I tend to be on that side, um, uh, you know, cautiously, cautiously optimistic, um, but there's a lot ahead of us too. And obviously the equity uh, piece is going to be a big issue. Um, I'm, I'm also a teacher educator. So um, thinking about the literacy gaps that are coming from uh, the K-12 sector, we've already had that K to 12, we, have, we already had that COVID issue uh, in, in terms of literacy gaps, but I, you know, we're wondering what curriculum writers will do, what teachers will do in terms of uh, better understanding literacy and what's needed uh, to you know, forge ahead through a sort of a formal education process. So I don't want to be much longer, so I'll pass it on. Thank you very much. Um, next is Brian, it's your turn. Excellent. Um, thank you very much. It's a pleasure to address all of you. Um, and uh, it's this is a nicer connection than the one I'm enjoying with Canada today, which is breathing smoke from uh, Nova Scotia and from Quebec. Um, and thank you for uh, all the comments. So really quickly, um, my own journey uh, involves teaching workshops on AI. And, uh, so I've, I've stunned people with the idea that AI could be used to help create content in various ways. Um, I've also created uh, scenarios based on AI um, in my most my previous book, uh, Academia Next, um, and uh, I've been looking hard at generative AI in education. Right now, for the past uh, six months, I've been doing a lot of work, uh, Future Trends Forum sessions, that's my program, my video program. We've done a bunch of these, which have become very popular on YouTube. I've been giving speeches uh, on AI, and I'm about to fire up a new project. So I, I think in, in terms of the challenges, um, one of the challenges we have is the sheer complexity and rapidity of the content. Uh, Alec mentioned a good point about the you know, net different knowledge uh, levels that faculty and staff have, uh, but this is incredibly challenging and complex and moving very, very quickly. Uh, second has to do with the impacts uh, that AI has on the world within which universities are embedded. Uh, think about the impact, for example, of, of fake news, uh, disinformation, deep fakes on everything from popular culture to uh, politics. And then, of course, the challenge of the labor market, questions about unemployment or uh, underemployment as a result of this. Uh, beyond that, the, there are numerous engagement points for higher education to connect with AI. Uh, the classroom, obviously, but also uh, academic research, obviously the library, thinking about student life and so on. And that the complexity of that ramifies the different institutional types, you know, universities versus colleges and so on. 
Uh, and then there's also the difficulty of transferring AI use cases across the complex global post-secondary ecosystem. Uh, someone at the University of Barcelona has a really clever idea for using AI in a French class. How is a professor in Tokyo or a professor in uh, Ottawa going to pick this up? Um, and on top of that, uh, within AI itself, uh, there are a lot of major serious potential changes over the next six months that uh, can make or break this in different ways. For example, uh, the big projects that we know about, you know, ChatGPT, BARD, Bing, all use enormous data sets. Uh, I mean, truly staggering amounts of data. And on top of that, a lot of computation. There's been some interesting developments, which let us uh, do pretty good work with much smaller data sets and with different kinds of computation. So there's this interesting choice. Are we going to actually see a range of data set sizes, uh, or are we going to stick to the giant ones? And if it's the latter, then there's this interesting question of to what extent we're dependent on capital intensive industries, you know, or businesses like Microsoft. Uh, there's the other challenge of will educators and people in creative industries and cultural heritage industries, uh, open up uh, our own type. Imagine, for example, um, uh, an open source tool uh, created by a bunch of co academic computer scientists that they run over a bunch of documents from, say, Hadi Trust um, or uh, the Internet Archive and produce something very different. Um, this may or may not happen. Uh, Jordan mentioned policy issues, and the policy issues are very deep, and we ran into the usual problems of, of trying to implement policy with digital technology that the legislators themselves are often way behind the curve. Uh, and overall, there's a major lag. Uh, plus, there's the possibility of a cultural turn, um, that there's a lot of uh, resentment and dislike and anxiety directed at Silicon Valley. And you can see that in pop culture, the depiction of tech bros as villains, uh, but you see it in journalism and you see it in the popular press as well. Uh, so it may be, uh, there's a, for all this so-called hype and enthusiasm around uh, AI, there's also a, a huge amount of terror and dislike. Uh, so it's interesting to see how that's going to shake out over the next six months. Months. I mean, I could imagine, for example, a terrible disaster, a plane crash, which people blame on AI, leading to a cultural turn against it. And maybe it doesn't happen or it gets regulated out of existence. Or maybe we decide to love the bomb after all and, and get along with it. So trying to my point is to try to think about how to use this in academia, its impacts in academia. Uh, we had to get to that point. We have to pass through a huge dark forest with many, many branching paths. Thank you, Brian. Um, next, I'll turn it over to Trish. Well, thanks, Laura, for having me follow Brian. That said, uh, I'm going to take us down the uh, the twisty, twisty, dark forest path, because I agree with you there, uh, for sure. So hi, everybody. It's a pleasure to be here. I sit a little bit differently in sort of this ecosystem and sort of the value stream. So I work primarily in industry with ties back into higher education. So a lot of the graduates, of course, that are coming out of higher education and coming into industry, how do we in workforce learning and performance bridge that gap, right? How do we take the graduates and help them be successful in the work environment in, in organizational life? And so when I'm looking at this and looking at it from the perspective of higher education, academia overall, education, and then coming into organizations in the workplace and in work life, I'm looking at even more of the macroeconomic factors that are at play that are happening globally. And so what do I mean by that specific to generative AI in this particular case? So I've also been working in artificial intelligence as it applies to adult learning for um, a number of years, uh, pretty close to a decade now. As far as my specific journey with generative AI, it started about the time that generative AI started. It was like, wow, this is going to be an amazing tool. How do we automate and augment? And I mean that in that order, right? We need to be looking at, as educators, we need to be looking at as facilitators, uh, as trainers, as instructional designers, learning experience designers, we need to look at automation first and how it is that we deconstruct our roles, the activities, the tasks that we do, and then augmentation second, because that's how fluid and fast these tools are moving in being able to take on tasks, right, at a, at a task completion level. So when I'm thinking about the macroeconomic factors in this, I'm thinking about how fast the technology is evolving, mostly because the costs are coming down, right? So one of the big factors is that the cost is coming down. So just uh, some numbers for some folks that like to have um, some numbers. So ARK Invest uh, here in the United States has done some research on this. And that is if a tool like ChatGPT had been developed back in 2015, it would have cost about $800 million. So 
2015, it would have cost about $800 million, but it wasn't created in 2015. The GPT, the Generative Pre-Trained uh, Transformer Model that's behind ChatGPT was created in 2020 at a cost of about $5 million, right? So we would have gone from 800 million in 2015 to 5 million in 2020 to today, how much would it cost to, to create that model today in 2023? It would cost about $500,000 US in order to create ChatGPT today. And ARK Invest has actually forecasted that to be able to create a large language model and to fine tune it in the same way that ChatGPT is by the year 2030 will cost less than $30 US. And so one of the things that Brian was really touching on is, you know, we have this, um, we have many forks that are kind of happening in the past where it's not just Silicon Valley who necessarily has access to being able to spin up these large language models what does it mean, and as an American, like if there's an Oprah moment where it's a large language model for everybody and you get one and you get one and you get one and everybody gets their own private large language model and that these models wind up being small enough to be able to have them on our smartphones. So we can look at like the, um, like Google just announced at the Google IO conference, Project Tailwind and Project Tailwind is exactly that. It's being able to take a large language model put it on somebody's smartphone and have it actually fine tuned to be able to relate to that person specifically based on the data and the information that's on their phone. So what happens when it is that we're not looking at as a species, right? We're, we're all focused on kind of chat GPT or have been, that's been, you know, the, the generative AI moment or has inspired that generative AI moment. But as we have these different options for many different reasons that become available, how does that really begin to change how it is that we have this experience and this journey in generative AI? And then what are the impacts back to our workforce? What are the impacts back to academia? What are the impacts that are back to um, education? So some of my thoughts there, and I am an excellent company. Thank you so much for having me today. Thank you. And now for this section, I'm going to give the last word to Valerie. Wonderful, thank you so much. Um, I'm also gonna give a couple of links. Um, I think they only go to the host and panelists, so I'll ask uh, that they be reposted for everyone's chat. Um, so I've been teaching online and open since 1998, so I've seen all of these different hype cycles. And yes, this is something different. Uh, and I, I think there are two sides of how you can approach it. Um, there, there is a side that it's, it's a, it's helping a cause that a lot of us in education have cared about, and that's how we handle assessment. And um, coming from having a background uh, in test theory and some psychometric assessment courses, it's really challenging seeing how grades are used in higher ed campuses and knowing that any instructor made assessment has a reliability of 0 0.4, which means you know, a scale of zero to one, which you throw it out, right? It's, it, but we've built an entire sector on it. And uh, the error there is tends to be biased against, you know, the more vulnerable people. So how do we undo that? There's been a movement towards ungrading, you know, pass fail, relational learning is becoming um, important consideration. So um, when chat GPT comes on the scene and just, and does all the, <laughs> the practice that people have been leaning on, but really it's a pillar they've been leaning on that really isn't supported. Um, and I'm not sure it's healthy. Uh, it's interesting, I've got a daughter in um, second year university and she just messaged me, uh, it was yesterday, that she got a, a paper back, you know, she, she wrote it herself, but the instructor said over half of the class used uh, chat GPT. My questions there are like, how do they know? Because they didn't, they weren't transparent with how do they know? And we also know that it's not reliable there either. So it becomes all of this noise that we have in the machine that is tearing down the relationships, tearing down the assessment. Sorry, there's some truck outside. Um, and I think questioning that is, is an important and healthy thing. So, um, and, and I do, um, I do think we're ill prepared in higher ed. Like we, we've been looking the other way and I'm going to drop a link um, I've, I've worked over the last couple of years with our BC government on creating a digital learning strategy. 
And it has been a gift, you know, to have a government go, yeah, we need one. And it's like a strategic plan that's being pushed down to all post-sec. Um, because I can tell you most post-secondary don't have a digital learning strategy. So I actually think some of these things are positive forces that are going to force us to do some of the planning work and have some of the discussions and hopefully invest in the expertise that we do need. Um, I also will put in, so if you can forward those links onwards, I'll put in one other link um, as well to a recording of a talk uh, hosted by the computer science um, if you scroll down, there's one that I was a panelist on there too. Great discussion on that one. Um, and some of the people were talking about, should computer science be regulated? And my father was an engineer, right? Civil structural engineer. He had to be regulated, right? He had to learn, you know, an update to keep his license. And yet computer science, you know, they're releasing apps on mental health that, you know, are trialing AI on you know, people with suicide, suicidal ideation. And it does, it does make me want to start talking about like, who's in charge? What are we doing? How are we doing it? And that's a bigger, bigger, bigger piece. But um, thanks for listening. Thank you. I'm kind of reeling from this range of, of ideas, um, which has been great. And I'm going to ask each of you now to think of how in in detail how generative AI could specifically improve different aspects of higher education, the ones that we're focusing on today, quality, equity, and inclusion, and mental health. And you'll again each have three minutes. Could you provide concrete examples or propose a, uh, a scenario on how generative AI can impact one of these one of these areas? And um, I will start again with Jordan. Excellent, thank you. So I have a few too many windows up here. I need an AI manager for all the windows I have now with all those great links from Valerie. Thank you so much for um, those links. It's uh, really lovely. So, uh, yeah, how can AI improve each aspect in, in higher ed? And I have notes on all of them, but I don't want to take all the time um, on the panel. So I think I'll focus on the, the equity and an inclusion angle. And I think that there we really see um, sort of two thoughts, um, or I have two thoughts on this. Um, and that's with regards to the uh, technology itself. As, and I like to believe it is more augmented rather than artificial intelligence. So augmented um, intelligence um, in sort of um, um, human machine meld, I think is, is where we can really help with the equity and inclusion. And by that, I mean, sort of for people that might have different abilities, um, having the AI fill in sort of the, the quote unquote missing parts, for example. And one, one use case to be very specific that I've seen recently, um, we have a faculty member who's visually impaired and it's pretty cool because right, he's spent his entire life having images that then are through a screen reader, he's told what those images are. And now he can type text and an image can be generated for him. And why is this important? Because he's a professor. And up until now, he commented, he came to our Center for Innovative Learning, and he said, I've been designing presentations that are really boring for the students, because I don't care about images. <laughs> I just put text on, on slides. I don't need to see a pretty picture to feel engaged in a lecture. Um, and somehow, I guess the students do. Um, so now he has a technology through DALI, he can type in a, a text or phrase or whatever, and an image comes up, he can stick it in a PowerPoint, then he comes by our Center for Innovative Learning, we can look at it, say, yeah, yeah, that looks like something that might work or resonate here. And now we have a sort of human machine meld that is enabling this person to, um, you know, resonate better or engage with the students more. So I think that's a lovely um, way that we can look at that. But then also we have to be really cognizant, again, coming back to this idea of the digital divide and everything. Um, and then also the fact that many of the augmented intelligent tools that our students would use off the shelf. I hope that they would be learning skills to design their own, but let's be honest, the vast majority of learners are gonna use off the shelf tools. We really need to be cognizant as we create policies regarding that use. And I think the best strategy there is to ensure that a diverse 
committee, a diverse panel, a diverse group of people reflecting on what we value in our communities, in our um, selves as human beings, will allow for the policy to be sufficiently flexible um, to achieve that. So we at LAU are currently going down the road of drafting an AI policy for the university. And I've uh, gone to great lengths to either make my life insanely difficult or hopefully generate an amazing policy because we have at this point about 16 people on the committee trying to make sure that every voice is heard. Students, faculty, everybody, I want to hear everybody's voice, at least initially. And I trust that, you know, eventually there'll be a sort of weed out um, point where we'll find those that actually, you know, work rather than just talk. My hopes. My colleagues, what do you say? Thank you very much. I'm going to um, ask Alec to to share his thoughts with us now. Yeah, so I'm going to um, probably discuss some of the mainstream um, hopes I'm seeing, but at the same time, um, you know, seeing the New York Times article uh, earlier, I think at the beginning of May, around how large language models could uh, help to read brain activity. And thinking about that sort of you know reading our minds uh, possibility, uh, especially when it comes to say nonverbal uh, learners, for instance, there's there's great uh, potential there. But in, in thinking and and hearing from my my colleagues and from others uh, about what students are doing already, um, I've heard examples like there was uh, you know a student who had, who came up, came across a really quite dense syllabus. Um, and they, they didn't have a clue. And, and I read the same syllabus too. And I can see that sometimes these syllabi get a little bit dense and we, we kind of add and add and add and they may not have learning outcomes and a number of other things. And uh, I think that just comes from, uh, you, know, uh, you know, from years of um, teaching and a focus on research and so on. And it happens, but but uh, students are uh, uploading their you know these syllabi to something like askyourpdf.com, and just asking questions like how do I finish the first essay? You know how do I accomplish this? Uh, summarize this course for me. Provide me with some learning objectives or outcomes. And you know this goes back to the the early days of AI with Pappard and Minsky and others who who touted the idea of personalized learning as being probably one of the most important potentials of AI. And I think that's where we, we should really uh, spend some time on in terms of understanding how we think differently about um, using assessment techniques, especially uh, personalized feedback. I've heard of students who um, run their essays uh, through ChatGPT uh, against the rubric that's provided by a student and saying, well, I've got 85 and telling the professor, I've got 85 of this in this on this test. Take a look, you know, you run it by your own rubric and and with fair, a fair bit of accuracy. And I, and the, po the potential and possibilities are amazing there to think that I can write an essay legitimately, run it across a rubric, get personalized feedback as to how to improve it on the rubric and do do that while you may not get that personalized attention from an instructor because obviously they're busy and there's only so much time. Um, so personalized learning and, and tutoring, you know, research assistant, uh, personalized feedback and assignments, uh, student or uh, exam preparation, there's budget and financing, you know, mental health, language learning. There, there's a ton of things that we can look at um, from the you know very, what I would suggest are quite simple um, achievements through AI that we can improve the classroom experience and learning experience for all students. I'll stop there. Thank you very much. Um, Brian, over to you. Uh, I just want to say what my colleagues said, um, but uh, if, if I can add a little bit more, uh, one is, I think, if I can focus on the quality issue, um, under research, we know that AI can do a couple of things. One is that it can help um, us find new content connections uh, between uh, different parts of a scholarly corpus. In fact, in Toronto, there was a Chan Zuckerberg Foundation project that was working on that for several years. Um, we can also think about using um, AI to help us in some research that involves huge data sets. 
Uh, thinking, for example, about climate change, uh, where AI is great at producing models and developing connections between many, many different parts. Uh, I'm thinking on the teaching side, there's there's quite a bit of opportunity for improving quality. And the, the general theme here, I think, is that uh, when we look at the art programs that came out a year ago, and we look at the, the text programs, that they provide, among other things, uh, writing and art assistance. Uh, they provide ways of helping us create more um, and some would say these are actually democratizing. I know my daughter thinks so because she views me as a horrendous artist. Um, and so she much prefers me to use Dolly or to use a mid journey to produce images. Um, and I think and we've already seen this. My favorite example, the most boring possible example came from a CNN report about the realtors uh, using ChatGPT to produce copy. Um, but think about this on the student side, uh, where students uh, have all kinds of challenges with creating writing. Uh, writer's block, uh, bad habits or bad uh, experiences in writing. And of course, uh, tackling the subject for the, for the first time. So this can help them create drafts and uh, it can help them be more creative creative. Uh, um, the other thing is, and this is something that Alec was pointing out that I don't think is fully appreciated yet, is that you can easily prompt uh, ChatGPT into serving as a kind of tutor. Uh, it can give you the assessment exercises that Alec described. I've successfully used it many times to work as a kind of uh, role-playing game runner or simulator, uh, where I've had it uh, coach me in teaching practices. I had to simulate a classroom with multiple students and to assess my work and, and figure out how I did. Uh, so all of that's available for students. On the faculty side, we also have the, the writing uh, and image creativity part, uh, I think actually appears there in many ways um, when it comes to making uh, assignments, making class documents of other kinds, and of course with the different parts of paperwork that we don't find quite as exciting. Uh, just this morning, I had to give a keynote speech on, on the future of the World Wide Web, and I quickly asked Slides GPT to generate a PowerPoint presentation, and it did. It took 60 seconds. Uh, and I used that in part because it gave me a nice consensus model, a very central, uh, unoffens inoffensive model of what people were thinking, and I could bounce off of that. Uh, faculty can also use uh, text generators to do some assessment. And I think above all, above all, uh, the experience of trying to think through what it means to have mid-journey or ChatGPT or BARD in a classroom, I think it defamiliarizes faculty in terms of thinking about assessment. Uh, you know, why do we assign essays? We, you know, what do we hope to accomplish with these exercises? And in fact, help us defamiliarize and rethink class design in general. There are all kinds of problems, but the but the prompt here was to speak to quality, and I think those are a few of the ways we can do that to improve higher education quality. Thank you, Brian. Uh, Trish? You know, it's it's really funny because then when I when I think about and, and when I when I watch what's happening along the lines with higher education and around the generative AI, especially around things like the essay assignments. And I think to myself, like we dream in the workplace of people being able to fast track and boost their productivity by being able to what we would call an academia cheat <laughs> and what we would call in the workplace as being productive and highly efficient, right? Like we're trying to get operational excellence. So we don't want people to work independently and individually. We want people to be able to work in teams, right? So we want them to be able to collaborate. So that whole genius that was discussed about the students kind of getting together and creating their own rubrics in order to be able to rate their work product, their essays against like what other past students have done. Like we would honor that in the workplace. Like we would think that's the best thing ever and that they would, you know, so then the next evolution of that is not only building the rubric in order to rate the essay that you've constructed, but now then to train the model in the context window to be able to create your future essays for you in your style, in the style of your voice, like, and again, going back to like, Brian, what you just said, like, so what is the purpose of the assignment of the essay? Like, what are we trying to accomplish on the higher education side, on the academic side? But in the workplace, we would want that to happen so that we can accelerate the work and we can we can move towards, you know, more of the higher quality faster. Right. So there are there are ways of being able to get gains like that. I also think about for students and for facilitators, uh, for teachers cognitive load, right? So I think all of the things that we've been talking about and the different use cases and examples are about we can decrease the cognitive load. And I come from a family of educators. Like I have um, seen what summers are like in a household of teaching. I have I have lived through those experiences of trying to do the enormity of work 
when work is not happening, when they're out, when teachers are outside of the classroom. I also think about, I was, I was working on, um, we had some technology during the height of the pandemic where here in the United States, we were trying to work with the National Science Foundation to help teachers in um, elementary school to be able to be faster. And what we found out was that we were solving the wrong problems before they could even get to any kind of instructional integrity in this world that we were in, in this virtual world that we suddenly found ourselves in. Um, they had other much more foundational uh, problems that they were trying to solve, like at the time, how to contact parents. They found that school systems didn't have access to parent phone numbers or email addresses to be able to get in touch with parents. Um, just basic things like classroom management and assignment management, like how do you keep the kids on track when they're not in your classroom every day? And so I guess that's what I'm thinking about with these generative AI tools as well in this age of AI, there's all this great stuff that we could do. Are we also returning to the basics of how it is that we can just remove sort of the friction in sort of those mundane everyday uh, kind of activities that are just, you know, taking people's energy, whether it's the, again, the faculty or it's the students or both. I also think in many of the comments, like 2023 is the year that content authentication and assessments break. And Valerie, you, you brought this up, and maybe that's a good thing. And what I mean by that is we're not going to see in the next Tom Cruise movie, in the next Mission Impossible, he's not going to be grabbing the bad guy and trying to do a retina scan. He's not going to be trying to do a voice scan because all of that now is moot since we can clone voices with AI and we can clone other personally identifying information um, with digital avatars and all the rest of it. So, so in this particular case, how are we thinking about not just the kids that are circumventing kind of the traditional or entrenched system in order to be able to complete like essay assignments, but we use assessment a lot as an example for uh, job candidates, right? Assessing the quality of the fit of a potential job candidate coming into the workplace and if people can now, you know, we're seeing all the numbers in generative AI, how much smarter those models are becoming on all these different assessment instruments, whether you're talking about passing the bar exam or you're talking about, you know, some of the um, uh, licensing requirements around professional, you know, professional services and, and professions, like, you know, forget people cheating because they were opening a book, now you're opening a model or you're opening multiple models that you're able to then optimize for being able to show up much better on these types of assessments that we're using for placement or gap analysis or, you know, all of those types of things. On the positive side, on the equity side, I think what's interesting to me is the ability now to be able to create media. So using text to image, using even text to video, to be able to create um, uh, images as an example that we didn't necessarily have access to before. So what I mean by that is we haven't had representative media uh, in many cases that we could use in our training materials, in our teaching materials. Um, we just didn't have access to that. Now we can go ahead and create that. So on the positive side of that, we can create that kind of media so that we're, there is equity as far as like representation. We can teach the kids, we can teach the students, we can teach the faculty how to use the tools in order to be able to do that. But then on the other side of that is um, how does that then displace true representation of actual photos of people of color, as an example, actual photos of indigenous people, actual photos of you know, are we displacing the human models who would otherwise, and we are, who would otherwise be used in those kinds of campaigns in order to generate those types of media? So I think it's been said before so far in all of this, the technology in and of itself is neutral. It's the applications and the implications. So how are we using it? How does it apply to a particular use case? And in any of those, how does it impact quality? How does it impact equity? And how is it impacting um, mental health? A last thing on that is I, I've been just um, stunned by what it is that they've been able to do at Khan Academy with Khan Migo and all the different applications that they've got. So I've been now part of that um, pilot group, both on the student side and on the faculty side, to see how it is that they're using generative AI broadly across the different activities and tasks that students and faculty complete. 
And um, I would highly suggest for those who are looking for something that gets into some specific details that are perhaps outside of the scope of what we're trying to achieve today, that Saul Khan's TED Talk, uh, recent TED Talk from maybe just a couple of weeks ago, is really an excellent source of being able to see some of the practical use cases on both the student and the faculty side. Thank you very much, Trish. Uh, Valerie, your thoughts? Yeah, I'm going to share uh, something. Aris Boskert from uh, uh, Andal Anadolu University in Turkey, um, uh, editor of uh, Asian Journal of uh, Distance Ed, I think it is, uh, got, I think, almost 40 of us together to do um, speculative methods. Think of a very short story that's positive. Think of one that's negative and published all of them. And I, I put the link in um, for uh, Vivian to push out to the chat. Thank you. Um, and it, it's, it's, I encourage you, if you want to have some nice reading, it's, it's some of it's very scary and some of it's very positive. And I'm going to focus on the positive right now. Um, page 88, I called it, uh, the kids are all right, life hacks for oppressive pedagogy, because I think we are oppressing learners. Um, what used to just be a, a midterm final exam, now we have 2% for this, 5% for that, so much. And we also have that. And I think now that we have the LMS and more and more people are using it, they're like, oh, maybe I'll add one more link, one more resource. And so I think uh, one learning designer at our institution compared an online and an a in-person section of a course and found that the online was um, th three times the work. So I think we're hurting our students. Um, I think we don't have any mechanism to track actual workload. The course evaluations might be, was this work, you know, this course heavier or lighter? Well, it's relative. I think we actually need to know exactly how many minutes. And I think AI could help with that. I think we could, and if anyone wants to build the business with me, um, I think we could actually use these tools to both have the learners go in and have it scan uh, the LMS, um, how many hours of reading, video, audio to watch, and how many assignments, what's the estimate of how much time this is, and they can drop the class quickly because they're walking in, taking five, assuming we are having duty of care and we're not. So then they implode partway through the years and some people turn to suicide. Like this is a real thing. There was um, a university in the UK, the parents sued the school because their assessment method wasn't accommodating her needs and um, they won. So universities now have to face that they can be liable. That's the precedence for how they handle things. And as far as I'm concerned, we are all liable right now. Every institution is liable for the overwork that we're putting on them. And I think that this um, app could also be on the administrative side, scan every LMS and spit out, oh, you know what? Faculty of so-and-so, you have 120 hours a week for your average student in your faculty. Fix it kids are dying. And so this, this app idea, this little positive story is that it scans it, produces summaries, Cole's notes of all the work for them because it's impossible to go through it all. There is no time. And to produce first drafts of work for them to work and edit. And guess what? They have time again. They can be healthy. They can be happy. They can be, you know, go exercise. But the system we created is, I mean, when we talk ethics, we are not ethical right now, maybe this tool, as complex as it is, could get us to a place where we can be more ethical in our practice. Thank you very much. Um, you've given a, a huge range of options of what we have to look forward to. And I've been um, busily trying to keep track of the links because there's a lot to follow up on. Um, I want to be very conscious of time, but I still want to give each of you one minute for if you want um, the people who are here to take one thing away from this session, what is it that you would like them to take away? So I'm challenging each of you. One minute. Jordan, go. Okay. So I apologize because, I, again, digital divide really big in my world. I just completely all routers, all servers, all um, electricity shut down and popped back up for me here. So I kind of lost the last bit of what Valerie was saying, which sucks because it was interesting. Um, so uh, I think just based off of what I heard Valerie say, and I, I agree, I think that one of the 
it, one of the biggest things we have to be afraid of is being totally reactionary to this technology. And that means also as we go to, to make sure that what students are doing is authentically their work, and maybe we have more of it done in the classroom, we have to make sure that we go back and rethink our pedagogies in the classroom as well. Are those inclusive? Are those accommodating? Because goodness knows they weren't always and they haven't always been. And so I think we need to really focus on making sure that whatever space a student is allowed to operate in um, is inclusive and allows them to do that to the maximum of their, of their potential. And if for some of them that means using these tools, then I think we have to learn to embrace that. Thank you, Jordan. Alec. So I created a, a while back, I created an image just uh, using mid-journey uh, around AI and education. And it gave me this really gray looking, horribly horrible robot in a classroom, very dystopianist. Um, and I, I thought that, you know, that's one possible future for all of this, is this very dystopian future. On the other side of the thing, uh, um, we, we see those who are these techno-optimists and pro probably techno-utopianists who, um, if, if you look at Lang, Langdon Winner's early work back in 86, he, he defined myth information as the almost religious conviction that a widespread adoption of computers and communication systems along with easy access to electronic information will automatically produce a better world for human living. And so I don't want to go down that road either, but I think it's, uh, for me, I'm a techno-progressive, um, and I believe that these technological developments can be empowering and emancipatory, but at the same time, they have to be regulated by legitimate and accountable authorities to ensure that um, the actual costs, risks, and benefits are fairly shared by all. And I, I think that's as, as important as in society in general as it is in the academy. So uh, that's where I sit on a lot of this. Thank you, Alec. Brian, over to you. I think, um, well, first of all, thank you, Alec, for mentioning um, uh, Langdon Winner. I mean, we've we've got this myth that from the 80s until 2012 or so that there was this uniform chorus of utopian dreams about technology. And it's really important to remember there's been technology criticism since the transistor, um, and it's often been very wide and deep criticism, um, especially in higher education. I think one thing to take away, if I could uh, reiterate a previous point is to not just think about this in terms of a single classroom and an instructor and a handful of students, but instead to think about this as a very, very complex systems problem uh, that, you know, on the one hand, we have um, uh, this changing world of work now, uh, which we had to prepare our students for. There are people uh, trying to analyze now, is there any technological unemployment happening this year? because of ChatGPT and because of images. Uh, you know, there's arguments right now about possibly joining the writer's strike in Hollywood, about having actors joining the writer's strike because of uh, their fear of, of being displaced. Uh, and the reason this matters is because in part, it's part of the economy that, that helps power our institutions, but also we're preparing our students for a world of work and we won't do them any good if we prepare them for the world of 2021 uh, when the post AI world is, is very, very different. Uh, similarly, we have to bear in mind uh, the real diversity of educational needs and purposes. Uh, I find a lot of the discussion is driven by people in the humanities. And I will discuss I'm a humanist. My PhD is in English, but um, but I'm not hearing a lot from science and social science uh, teachers. That is, there's a lot of concern about writing an essay, but I'm not hearing as much, for example, about writing a lab report, uh, which is much more difficult because you have to input a great deal more material. Um, and we're not hearing anything about how AI impacts, say, music performance, culinary arts, hands-on work with diesel engineering, that kind of thing. Um, plus, we've got an interesting uh, range of levels within post-secondary education, from you know the eighteen-year-old in their you know algebra one hundred and one class to the PhD students finishing off, as well as a range of ages. You know the right sixteen-year-old ahead of time through the seventy-year-old uh, going back to learn. Uh, on top of this, we also have already in higher education uh, a burgeoning ecosystem that provides us with all kinds of services. You think scholarly publishers, textbook publishers, you think about foundations and governments which provide grants and some oversight. Uh, how AI changes all of that is really interesting. Uh, for example, which businesses do we contract with? Um, you know, 
should a campus engage with OpenAI uh, or Microsoft, who really owns them, uh, to set up some kind of service? Or do we instead uh, look for startups uh, or try to find open source alternatives? I've already heard some interesting discussions among campus technologists about Microsoft infusing AI into its range of productivity tools um, under the pilot program. And there's been some interesting arguments saying, well, I, I'm i happy to have my students using Excel, but I don't think I want them necessarily to have AI helping them create spreadsheets. And Microsoft is basically saying, well, too bad. This is the new Excel. You're going to have that. Um, how does all of this fit together? And that, I, I think, you know, missing from our conversation really is the voice of students. Um, their experience, what their expectations are, and what they hope to accomplish. And again, students are a very, very diverse lot. Uh, so I, I would, I would, if you're going to take away anything, I would, I would get away from the microscopic view for at least a little while and think macroscopically about the huge system transformation that we're experiencing. Thank you, Brian. Trish, and thanks, Laura, again for having me follow Brian. Um, so. Yeah, from that systems perspective. And so there's a lot of opportunity there, right? And so what I think about with this is we've entered into where English is the new programming language, you know? So, you know, all of the the, the uh, parents that had, um, that were kept up late at night thinking about their English lit or medieval lit or, you know, journalism students and, and what might they do in this technological world we now have moved from code to prose, right? So prompt engineering is all about being able to use the language versus being able to you know, necessarily code in a, in a classic programming sense. And so in all of this opportunity, if we can be intentional, if we can be deliberate, Alec, I'm thinking back to the 1990s and the internet coming into play and the World Wide Web creating mass public adoption or, or even then it wasn't even so mass, right? Until we got into like the mid 2000s um, and, and what I mean by that is we can use this to democratize the opportunity. We can use this as a moment of being able to, to get into um, perhaps populations and to communities and to have real societal impact by helping people be able to connect with this technology and being able to, to use this really, to, to be able to use this forward. And I think, you know, in being mindful, in being able to bring the right people together, in being able to have that kind of representation across the board when it comes to regulation, when it comes to the job force, when it comes to the labor market, when it comes to taking a look at, you know, again, I agree that that macro, how do we zoom out into that macro lens and this moment of time, how do we best leverage it in order to be able to move people forward and maybe this becomes something that helps to unite us around the world, rather than something that you know uh, divides us. That that would be my hope in in looking at how it is that we leverage this moment moving forward into the future. Thank you, Trish and Valerie. I'm going to give you the last word. Wow, that's a lot of responsibility. <laughs> <laughs> um, so I, I think uh, that digital learning strategy that I mentioned that's provincial. Um, it's creating a mechanism for institutions to talk to each other because it makes no sense if you, let's say, go to UBC and they're enabling something and go to UVic or spanning something or go to a college. And it's like we need to share our struggles, share what we're learning. Um, and so uh, in that process, in that strategy, we're having a forum uh, once a year where in reps from each institution can come together and talk about issues, share resources, share policies. We need more sharing uh, between institutions. Um, so I'm, I'm happy to see that moving forward. But I also think that we need to um, look at youth voices. It's a big, you know, I support it a lot in various different contexts. And I think we need to bring on youth voices as part of this as well. The, the students, I mean, they may not be youth, we may have mature learners, but um, but their lived experience and what they're doing, because I've, I've done studies where I've talked to leadership and in interviews, and then I, you know, do one on one assessment meetings instead of grades, and I have conversations instead, and the, <laughs> there's a big gap between the lived experience, the cultural experience, the, the tool sets that they use, and um, we can't have traditional leadership dictate what the next gen university is going to be. So in whatever we do, we need to bring in the students themselves to this as well. 
and I'll drop in the chat um, some resources um, that we'll be posting soon from our Otessa conference. We had um, Sarah Lane Eaton do a keynote on AI and integrity and Alec did a, a talk as well and there's more. So we'll be posting those available soon. Great. I, I wanna thank e each of you for your incredibly thoughtful and rich comments. I'm very happy that this session is being recorded because I wanna go back and and sort of see if I can unpack all of the, the comments, but I think um, there's a lot that we can take away and you've given us really good food for thought and focusing, including students is a major reminder that we all often need because it tends, we tend to get caught up in the business of managing the university or thinking about the profs and we can lose track of the students who need to be an integral part of the conversation. Um, so with that, I'll reiterate my thanks and turn the microphone back to Nadia. Thank you so much. So we, uh, again, thank you so much for everyone. Thank you, Laura. We have exactly three minutes before our next panel. So uh, a very short break and we'll continue this discussion, but in French. So see you in, in two minutes, almost two minutes. Thank you. Bye.